Good afternoon. I'm amazed that there's still so much of energy in this room uh, after two, month, uh, two days into this, uh, into this very intense conversation. We are now moving to a part that very many of you are looking forward to <laughs> because we have been listening, discussing, exchanging about the, those groups to whom we are accountable to, survivors, the public, members, and children, and to some extent all of us, I believe or almost all of us, are accountable to these groups in a different degree, because almost all of us are here also uh, representing groups that are mentioned in Vos Estis Lux Mundi. But, in a special way, those who are accountable are those who have been entrusted with a particular leadership role in the church. And first among them are bishops, since our Catholic Church is built on this principle. And we are very happy that two archbishops have accepted our invitation. Our Archbishop Paul André Durocher is the Archbishop of Gatineau in Canada since 2011. He sits on the Executive and the Assembly's Council for Communities and Ministries in his Bishops' Conference. He accompanies the group of diocesan respondents for the prevention of sexual abuse. Himself has been, if I'm not mistaken, president of the conference in 2013 to 2015. And he is also an alumna, uh, alumnus of the Gregorian University in a licentiate in theology not long back. <laughs> Second, we welcome Archbishop Simon Peter Poe from the Archdiocese of Kuching in Borneo in Malaysia. He's Archbishop since uh, 2017. Before that, he was Auxiliary Bishop. He's leading the commission, the um, congregation, sorry, the Bishop's Conference's uh, Committee on Young People and New Evangelization. He's at the Asian Bishop's Conference's Council for Interreligious Dialogue. He holds a licentiate in missiology from the Urbaniana University here. Let us welcome the two archbishops among us and join me in giving them a round of applause. The idea is that uh, each of the, the archbishops will give now a presentation of about 30 minutes, uh, each one, and uh, first Archbishop Durashi, then Archbishop Po, then there will be a little interaction among them. So Archbishop uh, Simon will re reply to Archbishop Paul André and vice versa for about 15 minutes. That should bring us to about four o'clock. We would have then the break and at 4.30, hopefully we can come ba back for the question and answer session for all of you. But now I'd like to ask Archbishop Paul-André Durocher to give his presentation, Challenges of Accountability to, Vic to Bishops. So do we have this uh, presentation? No signal right now? <laughs> there we are. So, uh, as I prepared this intervention, I thought a lot about how we would use, how we use the word accountability. It's been pointed out that there's no direct equivalent of this word in French, which is my mother tongue, in Italian or Spanish, in, in the Romance languages. We tend to use something closer to res responsibility, responsabilité. Responsabilita. Uh, but it, responsibility speaks of one aspect of accountability. 
close to the, the adjective, you know, to be accountable, to be responsible. But when we say to be held accountable, you know, I'm holding you accountable, there's something else that is being added to the idea of being responsible. There's also the idea of being imputable for an action or a situation. And accountability goes further when we look at it as an attitude in life or as a virtue even. We could speak about the virtue of accountability. It implies taking true ownership for a situation and personally engaging with it in order to move forward towards a set goal. And so it's in consideration of this attitude that I want to answer the questions, what are the challenges of accountability for bishops? Or another way of asking the question, why do I find it difficult to develop the virtue of accountability in my life as a bishop, and particularly concerning the sexual abuse of minors by our clergy? Now, the first fact that I should acknowledge is that I do indeed find it difficult to acknowledge my responsibility in this area. As a young person, uh, as, as a young priest, when I first became aware of priests having abused young persons, it, it was through a, a newspaper article about a lawsuit that was launched against a diocese. And I clearly remember asking myself, why are they suing the diocese? Somebody asked that question here. The priest is the one who abused. Why don't they sue the priest? What does the diocese have to do with this? When I became a bishop, I was faced with 15 similar lawsuits in the diocese where I was named. I told myself, my predecessors, they didn't know what those priests were doing. And I was frustrated that they, or my diocese, was being held responsible for the consequences of such acts that go against everything the church stands for. It took me a while to realize that my attitude could actually make it easier for a priest to abuse a young person in my diocese. That my refusal to, or my resistance to accept responsibility was opening the way to further acts. Obviously, I'm not responsible in the same way that the abusing priest is. However, I do have a share of responsibility which I must acknowledge and which should guide my own attitudes, my decisions, and my actions. And in that sense, I must rise to the challenge and embrace accountability as a positive stance which will lessen the possibilities of abuse in the church. I recently read an article which outlines 16 traits of accountability in the business world. I found this article intriguing and challenging. These 16 traits were presented in a study published 30 years ago by three American authors, Roger Connors, Tom Smith, and Craig Hickman. The title of their book is The Oz Principle, Getting Results Through Individual and Organizational Accountability. They call it The Oz Principle because they use the story of the Wizard of Oz as a template to study the idea of accountability. Their approach provides an efficient structure as we seek to identify some of the challenges diocesan bishops face in developing an attitude of accountability. I'm indebted to them for their insights in helping me organize my thoughts and present them to you in a coherent fashion. Of these 16 traits, the first four deal with my ability to see the situation, to understand it from the inside, as it were, to grapple with its dimensions, its breadth, 
its meaning and its impact in the lives of those immediately affected, but also in the life of the church and of our world. So to see the situation, I must learn to obtain the perspective of others and especially of victims. It's not really easy for a bishop to obtain the perspective of others on this issue of sexual abuse. There aren't many occasions for me to hear their thoughts on this issue, so I need to create spaces for this to happen. And I must school myself in listening. For example, I don't necessarily enjoy reading articles or watching documentaries about sexual abuse of minors in the church, but how will I understand the perspective of others if I don't discipline myself to do this? I must also create spaces for discussion on this issue where I am present and take time to listen. Whether this be at a meeting of the priest's council or the diocesan pastoral council or during the pastoral visitation of the parishes of my diocese, this requires me to plan actively and to decide to make it one of my priorities. Secondly, I need to communicate openly and candidly. And to be honest, this is not a habit in our church. We tend to be circumspect. We want to save face, not embarrass anyone. We have trouble acknowledging that our predecessors did not handle these situations correctly, that they were misinformed, or that they were unprepared, untrained. We have difficulty recognizing our own shortcomings and asking forgiveness for not having been up to the challenge. We want to protect the reputation of the diocese or of the priesthood. And so we obfuscate and we shade the truth. We need to get over this. We, learn, we need to learn to speak with courage, or parresia, as Pope Francis often reminds us. We need to believe that the truth will set us free. Third, we need to ask for, and we need to offer feedback. I shared this in my small group uh, yesterday. I taught high school for five years as a young priest. It was a public school, so they didn't see me as a priest. They saw me as an employee, a teacher. And as a teacher, my work was regularly evaluated. I looked forward to the occasions where I would get feedback concerning my efforts. I appreciated the suggestions that were made to me to help me become a better teacher. Why is such regular evaluation not integrated into the life of the priest. We need to learn to ask others to tell us how we're doing, how we might improve, particularly in the area of clergy sexual abuse. Many dioceses now have consultative committees in this area. Could we not ask them what they think of our efforts as bishops, what their expectations might be, what suggestions they might have for improving my ministry as a bishop. But I also need to learn to offer my own feedback in this area, particularly with my peers at the level of the Episcopal Conference and with the priests who need leadership from me. And finally, in order to see the situation, I need to hear and say the hard things in order to see reality. When we're speaking of the sexual abuse of minors, we're speaking with very hard things. To listen to a victim speak of their abuse and its consequences in their lives, to speak of our own sorrow and shame at what happened, to listen to survivors speak of how they were not believed or how their complaint was dismissed, to speak our apology, a true apology, 
for how they were treated. These are very hard things indeed. And yet we need to do them to face head on the reality of this scourge. Only at this price will things change. The next four traits deal with owning the situation, owning the issue. You know, we, you can see it, but you own it. This entails engaging it with it personally, seeing it part as, as part of my responsibility and focusing on it in a serious way. So first of all, I need to be personally invested. Now, why is this difficult? As bishops, we learn to delegate and to entrust to others the many issues that cross our desks daily. When it comes to sexual abuse of minors in Canada, we've been encouraged to name a diocesan delegate to receive and manage complaints. We've been asked to create consultative committees to discuss these issues. We've been told it's good to hire specialists to develop guidelines and implement them in our dot parishes. And all of this is excellent. But it runs the risk of disengaging the bishop from the issue and of avoiding personal involvement. I need to keep myself informed, to accept to meet people and answer their questions, to participate in meetings, and to support those who are bearing the load. There's a lot to do as a bishop, I can tell you that, but this issue is crucial and it demands that I make of it a personal priority. To own the situation, I need to learn from both successes and failures. No doubt some people will ask, where are there successes in this issue? Well, I believe that helping justice move forward, fostering healing of victims and creating secure environments are all successes, and I can build upon these as I study what worked and why. And I can learn even more from the successes of others, see how they are moving forward and follow their example. But I can also learn from their failures, from my own failures. To do this, I need to acknowledge them, to face them. This requires lucidity and humility. I must pray the Spirit to give me such virtues and grace as I strive to put them into practice. I need to ensure that my work is aligned with key results. Recently, our diocesan coordinator for safe environments brought something to my attention. She pointed out that some of the objectives I had set in the decree establishing our diocesan polity, policies had been forgotten, and that we needed to reflect on them and see how we could attain them. She had gone back to the original vision, compared it to what we were doing with that vision. I thank God that she had the insight to do this, for it's important that we continually return to the key results we're striving for to evaluate our own work. This requires of bishops to make sure that those key results have been identified, well communicated. Part of accountability in an organization is ensuring that everyone feels engaged and commits themselves to attaining the key results that have been identified. That in itself can be a challenge, but it helps us to learn to be accountable. And fourthly, in order to own the situation, we need to act on the feedback we receive. It's one thing to be open to feedback, it's another to act on it. As parishioners, the public, children's advocates and survivors speak to us and share their insights, it behooves us not only to receive their advice, but to work with our teams in adjusting our policies and actions. It takes energy to listen to feedback even more energy to act on it. Sometimes I get discouraged. However, I must remember that the people who are giving me that feedback 
are also investing a huge amount of energy as they reach out to me and share their insights and wisdom. The only way I can honor their engagement is by making sure that it bears fruit as I act on the feedback that I've received. Okay, so I see the situation, I've owned it. Well, now I have to work at solving it. What approaches can actually help to move the church forward? What can I do personally to contribute to the transformation that needs to occur? So, first of all, I constantly have to ask myself, what else can I do? That in itself is a challenge, you know, because we feel we're doing a lot and investing a lot. And, and to continually say, yes, but perhaps there's more I can do. It's pretty easy for me to compare myself to others and see that I'm doing pretty well and sit back and rest on my laurels. I must resist that temptation. I need to consider all the time and energy a bishop dedicates to making sure that money is well managed in his diocese and parishes. We spend a lot of time making sure money is well managed. That safeguards and auditing of finances are continually carried out, that experts are consulted and policies updated, that there's personnel to carry out these questions about money. Yet how much more important are the experiences of children as they set out on the journey of life? As a bishop, it seems I never shirk from the needs, what needs to be done around money issues. Shouldn't I be just as committed when it comes to caring for the weakest and the most vulnerable among us? And that's why I need to ask myself continually, what more can I do? What are the best practices arising? How can I integrate them into my ministry and my diocese? I must admit that this conference has been very tiring for me because I've been writing down continually, oh, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. Oh, here's something new. I've got such a work list to do when I go back home. <laughs> But I'm afraid too many dioceses and too many of our priests and our faithful think that the crisis is behind us. I believe this crisis will always be with us. Always. Because just like the, the poor, there will always be abusers among us. We cannot let down our vigilance. We must constantly seek to improve. I need to learn to collaborate across functional boundaries. In my small diocese, my diocesan staff were 10 people. That's all, just 10. There's the bishop's office, there's the pastoral services, there are administrative services and the, the, the chancery, four offices. It's remarkable how, despite our small size, we still manage to compartmentalize so that functional boundaries that are meant to make our work smoother become barriers to collaboration and true efficiency. Recently, in the Archdiocese of Montreal, there was a study done by a judge, Judge Pepita Capriolo. She investigated a particular case which was mishandled and among the various recommendations that she made, there was this one. That a clear and well-defined flow of information be established laterally between the various departments and vertically from the employee to his superior or her superior and to the archbishop. She had found that the lack of collaboration across functional boundaries within the diocesan staff had contributed to the poor management of the case she was asked to study. 
As a bishop who oversees the overall administration of my diocese, it rests with me to make sure that all staff members and volunteers collaborate in a spirit of common purpose and vision to safeguard against sexual hand abuse and to handle complaints with care and with speed. Third, I need to learn to deal creatively with obstacles. I remember once uh, hearing that a victim had expressed the desire to meet with me as the bishop, despite the fact that he had launched a lawsuit against the diocese, he wanted to speak with me. Our insurance company lawyers uh, who were handling the lawsuit were completely against such a meeting. But I knew something of the background of the story. I felt strongly that such a meeting would help the victim with reconciliation and with healing. So I spoke to our diocesan lawyer. He explained to me why the insurance companies were against this meeting, but he accepted to find a way for the meeting to happen that would satisfy them. Ultimately, the presence of a personal mediator the establishment of clear objectives and limits to our conversation allowed the meeting to happen to the clear satisfaction of the victim. I tell this story because we often face obstacles when dealing with individual cases or when establishing diocesan-wide policies. We can't let these obstacles stop us from moving forward. I find discussing such issues with people outside my diocese often gives me new perspective, helps me imagine creative solutions. This also is part of growing in accountability. We need to take the necessary risks. Um, the first time I was confronted by TV cameras following a meeting dealing with sexual abuse, I was so scared I bolted out the door and ran away locking myself into a room from which I couldn't exit. <laughs> My lawyer suggests that I get some media training. <laughs> a few years later, I was asked to participate in a talk show on National Public TV Network to talk about the clergy sexual abuse issue. At first, I refused. I had seen the host of this program at work. I knew how he could be merciless in his questioning, especially when it came to a representative of the church. But our media consultant told me that if I didn't go, my chair would remain empty, and the people around the table would be able to say anything they wanted without anybody to respond. And so I reluctantly accepted. I have rarely been as nervous as the evening I stepped onto the soundstage of that talk show. But my sister, told me to count on the presence of the Holy Spirit who abides in the hearts of people of goodwill and convinced me that the audience wanted to hear a message of hope and they would receive it warmly if I gave it. She told me to make a sign of the cross on the desk as I walked into my place for the interview. She told me to do the same thing this afternoon. <laughs> But you know, she was right. I allowed myself to be open and transparent, acknowledging our failures, but speaking of our efforts to right these wrongs. I ended the evening exhausted, but at peace. The host even invited me to join him and his staff for a beer at the local bar afterwards. Here was a time I took a risk, and it paid off. Doesn't always. But that time it did. As a bishop, it's easier for me to stay in my comfort zone and not take such risks. However, I can't grow in accountability if I'm not willing to do so. I need to remember the Holy Spirit is with me and dare take the necessary steps for the sake of the children. Five minutes? Do I still have five minutes? Yeah. So the last four traits remind us that we need to do whatever needs to be done. So... Act. The first thing is it's important that I do the things I say I'm going to do. 
I know that people's expectations on this issue are high, and in various situations I find myself promising to undertake a certain action in response to their demands. Sometimes I'll be interviewed by journalists, and in answering their questions, I'll commit myself to acting in a particular way. I've met survivors, and in conversation with, my, with them, promised to change a certain process or an approach in my diocese or in my personal response. I attend meetings of committees where I find myself saying, mm, I'll follow up on your recommendations. It's essential that I do it. As young people like to say, I must walk the talk. Research has shown that credibility is the single most important attribute of effective leadership. And nothing undermines credibility more than promising to act and not acting. So the challenge lies in facing the time and energy to enact my promises. I've got a lot of issues to deal with. My agenda is already full. I'm exhausted by the scope of Episcopal ministry. It's so easy to put off to tomorrow anything that isn't urgent, however important it might be. One helpful approach I've found is to empower one of my staff to constantly remind me of my commitments, one of our secretaries. It's her job. Bishop, Bishop. <laughs> and she feels bad when she says that. I said, thank you, thank you. And the other thing that helps is to bring these commitments to prayer so that I reflect on them in God's presence. It's harder to ignore them. <laughs> I need to stay above the line. The line here is the line between the virtue of accountability on top and the attitudes that keep me below the line, that I don't develop the virtue. Some of these attitudes might be waiting to see what happens, expecting others to tell me what to do, refusing to take responsibility, blaming others, blaming the culture, blaming media, ignoring the problem, denying it doesn't exist, seeking to seek my own reputation or career. I need to be constantly on guard against these attitudes and root them out as soon as they appear in my thoughts, my reactions, and my judgments. Staying above the line requires fortitude, insight, perseverance, and courage. I need to pray the Holy Spirit to impart these gifts to me and those I work with to help me truly develop accountability. I need to track progress with proactive and transparent reporting. Um, I need to give an account of my actions to stakeholders. We've identified four groups during this conference. Victims, children, the faithful, the broader public, it behooves us to find ways of informing each of these groups about what we're doing, the programs we've implemented, the innovations we've undertaken. Most people in my country are unaware of this. Most of the members of the clergy don't know. We haven't truly engaged in reporting about our activities. And perhaps one of the problems is true communication involves dialogue. We simply can't issue a report and then refuse to answer questions about it. We need to find ways of receiving and responding to the reactions, whether they be positive or negative. We need to be open to the judgments of others, accept their praise, yes, but also be open to their complaints when they say it's not efficient enough, it's not thorough enough, it's not radical enough, it's not broad enough. Am I open to accepting those comments? These questions testify to the challenges I face in trying to grow in accountability. And the last is to build an environment of trust. I guess we can understand this as the goal that we're striving to achieve. The church can't fulfill its purpose of proclaiming the gospel and of gathering Christ's disciples and fellowship and prayer and sending them to continue Christ's mission in the world if it loses the trust of its members, particularly its most wounded and vulnerable. Or the trust of the people of goodwill who look to us for guidance and example? The sexual abuse crisis has deeply hurt that bond of trust between bishops and priests, between laity and clergy, between believers and non-believers. Many inquiries into public opinion show that the Catholic Church is one of the least trusted organizations in North America. In spite of all the good we do in works of education, social welfare and development, healthcare and art outreach, we are not considered trustworthy. It's going to take a long time to rebuild that trust, probably a few generations. But it will only happen 
if we continue to make it a priority, if I, as a bishop, make it my priority, developing an attitude of accountability will foster trust, and fostering trust will help me grow in accountability. So in conclusion, I just want to thank you. I've been a bishop for 26 years now, and I've been involved in this issue since my Episcopal ordination. But focusing on this topic of accountability has forced me to look at my own attitudes, making an examination of conscience, challenging me to develop attitudes, forcing me to take a serious look at my continued commitments and actions. So I thank God for this occasion. I thank you, the leaders of this conference, for having given me this task. And may my poor words help you to respond to the challenges of growing in accountability, each in your own way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Archbishop. It sounds like magic, the visit of Oz if you look at those points, but in fact you have spelled them out in a, such a palpable and such a, a concrete way that uh, we are looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Archbishop Simon. When Archbishop Paul presented that, it looks like I'm going through an examen of conscience, <laughs> looking at what I have done, what has not been done. But I think I realized something. I come from Asia, I come from Borneo, this is from Borneo, carving a place called Sarawak, where in Asia the uh, abuse has not actually blown up, so we are actually not hearing a lot from Asia. It doesn't mean it's not there, but it also tells me immediately that what has happened uh, in this particular in Canada, US, I can even name Ireland, Germany, all over the place, that we cannot uh, just close our eye and we just have to see now, we have to learn to see. And uh, for me, it's a, now on the situation, what is happening on the ground. And before it blows up, then, yeah, we have to do something in Asia. So it was for me actually a additional impetus that from Asia, we need to do something. I like the aspect of uh, his sharing that goes very personal. And you can see the heart of a shepherd struggling to, because he cares about the community, the, the, the people of God. Uh, there are so challenges there. Uh, among within the church, as you hear in the share, heard in his sharing, sometimes uh, the clergy are not fully with us. And then uh, we have to struggle with that. And above all, the responsibility, accountability comes very heavy on the bishop. And I felt that also being appointed as an archbishop, though for seven years, and in my year for 26 years, that's a very heavy burden. And it, was a, it became a heavier burden because of the situation of the, he said he was, he took over and immediately there were cases. I admire your courage for that and taking it fast on. So that also gives me courage, uh, strength to go forward. I love the fact that he collaborates, he listens to his, the people around him, that openness that allows communication to tell the bishop, bishop, listen, what about this, what about that? And the coming forward now to engage the press. It's amazing that uh, what I see happening and uh, well, do what, needs to be done and walk the talk. Maybe you want to say some response of Father Hans? All right, so he'll present. I do my session now. <laughs> Here or there? There. Okay, so now, Tocame Saint Austell in, in Italian is my turn. Uh, challenges and crises. I'm going to come from a perspective of uh, some an Asian perspective that we 
have not fully grasped the situation yet, the accountability. And I know that uh, what I've learned is only the last few years from Father Hans Zoner and from Dr. Gabriel, who's here, and also sessions that we've been given. I do have a personal encounter with a child victim who is now an adult, but uh, he was abused in a private kindergarten not connected to our church or the Catholic faith. But still, uh, it's something that, that is where we saw the crisis happening. My responsibility, it heightens the need of my responsibility, my accountability. But before that, I started speaking about that in, in our church, in Malaysia, and eventually in Synod on the Young People and the Youth. So I would like to bring across also from the cultural dimension, when the Chinese, my grandparents came from China, I'm a Malaysian. Danger has two components, Wei Ji, those who read Chinese. It means to say crisis is danger and opportunity. In every crisis, there's both danger and opportunity. So we are looking through this crisis and we have an opportunity to do something. So I can always do something. And we're not even talking about the accountability start with I accepting and owning the process and do something. So I'm looking after the young people. So in, uh, when I went to attend the Synod on Youth, I talked to the young people. And in my diocese, there's very little resource. We have no knowledge of safeguarding not even to say about accountability. How do we begin? There's not much resources, but in my heart, I wanted to do something. My young people tell me, let's do something. So on the Synod on Youth, I spoke about that in 2018, and it was picked up by the news, and saying that I'm among the several Catholic bishops who focus and talk about this. There was very few voices, and I was one of the Asian voices, together with the voices from the US and from Europe. But I was among the single voice from Asia. And that was when I took the step forward for doing something. And the youth from Malaysia told me, Archbishop will come back there in the 20s and 30s. And of course, uh, I know many of them are not being abused because they're very young, otherwise it will come out. But they said, let's do something to create a safe environment. And so for the accountability, start by walking the talk. I told the young people, we do something. So we have just drafted a safeguarding pledge form for people in my diocese to do, including priests, religious Sunday school teachers, and youth ministers. So I passed this form to them, and we took the baby step. At the youth minister's retreat in Malaysia, we said we should be the one to sign and what are we going to be responsible for? One, I have not been charged or convicted for any sexual misconduct. Two, there's nothing that uh, you can do a background check on me. Three, I'm committed to safeguarding. Four, I'm going to use my best effort to work positively towards safeguarding. And five, we'll take measurable measures, reasonable measures to ensure a safe environment. Everything was not in place. We do not have the hardware. Uh, the classrooms, the rooms, everything were not there, but we only had the desire to say two things. Uh, this is the pledge form that, uh, as a young people, we all sign. And then the young people say, we want to do something. We want to just say the church is a safe environment. All the children and youth who come to work with us as youth ministers are safe. And the funny thing is, or oh, something, God work. I send a copy, of course, to the respective bishops, and nine of them. A few months later, they asked me, Where's the form from? And my brother bishop said, we would like to use it for our diocese. And by then, my priest already had signed, and all the, then, then it began to be spread around in Malaysia. The priest started to sign awareness and commitment. So what we are saying, that starting accountability for us is a baby step. We are declaring that our church is a safe environment for children and minors. That was all we did. And despite having little resources, and the formation at that time, BSO office, professional standard officers, have not been set up, and our protocols have not been approved. We just took the baby steps and just make that declaration. So signing the pledge is easy to carry out. Just fill the form, 
there's no cost involved for other uh, dioceses and many of the bishops. The, what is needed is only the will power to do something that is needed. We can do something. And this is basically to discourage people like Bidofi Richard Hucker, who came and molested over 200 Malaysian children. The pledge form we sign is to declare, deter Bidofi because there's some, uh, I think we need to change the English. Because when we sign the form, permission is given to us a big background check with the government. And therefore, we can say these people are not welcome. And we just cross that message. We do not want people to come in with this background. And it stopped, at least they didn't come into our church. Now, the question on accountability. We also had some issue being a new being new to this in Malaysia, who is accountable in the diocese? Is it the bishop or religious superior? We struggle with this. But in the Catholic Bishop Conference of Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei, three countries coming together as one conference, we have annual meetings. And this allows bishops and religious superior of the congregation, the forum to dialogue. And we could realize we of course, we collaborated on sharing resources on migrant ecology trafficking. And then the last few years, we picked up on safeguarding and protection of minors and vulnerable. That was the starting point that religious and the bishops' conference come together. And this even became more crucial for us. When there was a case in Singapore, 5th of May 2022, it was reported a member of a Catholic religious order in Singapore committed sexual acts on two teenage boys, was jailed for five years. That's the headline from the newspaper. The religious knew about this in 2009. They sent the person for rehabilitation, which worked. By 2013, the new Archbishop of Singapore was appointed. He's now the Cardinal. And he only got the news in 2020. And of course, we knew by then, report were, has to be met. And in Singapore, we follow the civil system. The offender was charged and jailed. And immediately on the morning of the conviction, Archbishop Go, William Go, now Cardinal, issued a pastoral letter apologizing on behalf of the church. Like many of you, I am dismayed, shocked, and ashamed. My heartfelt sympathy, etc., etc. May justice be rendered accordingly. And it pained me to realize that he was not the archbishop when it happened. This thing happened even before he took office. But it also now tells me that this is basically who we as bishop, as Archbishop Post said, you are in charge, we are accountable for that, and we take full responsibility as a bishop in charge, even though it is some, something that happened before us. And the new document from Pope Francis asks that now the bishop takes the responsibility, and we are, so that is immediately something for us in the Asian context, uh, a big burden, and he asked Metropolitan to take, take the extra heavier responsibility, the means the Archbishop. Uh, realizing that also helped me to uh, coming to terms with that means it is something serious, and we have to take that duty. Where exactly, how exactly I'm going to do that, I will have to learn from many of you. You'll be the teacher for me. I'm glad that in Philippines, we have already the safeguarding team in place and we'll be consulted and we'll ask, how do we move from this? Our nearest neighbor down under in Australia uh, would be very helpful. And so I believe we can do something. So the accountability, we're not even talking about dealing with cases directly, except for Singapore, but it will come to us. So in the, in the uh, Asian context to make things even harder for us. I would, I'd like to bring this up because we were talking about uh, the, I heard the African context and I could identify with you as an Asian. 
And one of the things for me as an Asian is individualism versus collectivism. And in Asia, there's a culture of silence, sham and saving fast. The core difference between Eastern and Western culture is contrast between emphasis on surf and the importance of the community on the other side. Surf, community or individual is emphasized, focusing on autonomy, personal achievement and independence. And Asia culture places importance on family, clans, clan and community, valuing the needs of the group and community often over the individual. I like the express, expression, the nail that stands up get knocked in. And that's why Asian hardly talk about safeguarding. Maybe I'm the only bishop that started talking about that and I maybe I'll get a bit of a flag. But all the same, uh, in the situation of the Asian context, in order to preserve relationship within family and community, sorry, uh, typo, Asian cultures often default to suppression in order to maintain social harmony. There is a need, the need and the good name of the group takes precedence over the individual's needs. And the unspoken culture of silence is the undercurrent. And that's what I've been saying. And we don't talk about sexual abuse. We don't talk about incest. Uh, it is kept within the family. On top of that, there is a challenge from patriarchal society and the new concept of power differentiation needed to be understood. We struggled with that. But it means uh, simply power differential means the difference in power between persons in position of authority and those individuals in subordinate positions that result in a vulnerability on the part of the subordinate priest and parishioner. Uh, teacher and student, coach and the person under training, etc. Doctor and patient or even nurses and so on. Priest and seminarian, bishop and priest. So we have that power difference. And uh, it is something that we are learning. And accountability means the person in charge with the higher power is the one who has to take the responsibility to be accountable we, at the bottom line, the bishop. Between the bishop and the priest, the bishop takes, uh, the, is, has a higher control or power, so to say. Uh, but I hope the power is from uh, serving and not from authority. The authority is not from position, but from serving. In any case, uh, in Malaysia and Indonesia, we have a word Harap kan paga, 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 paga makan padi. Means paga is a fence. Padi refers to the rice in the paddy field. We put our hope in the fence to guard the field, but the field add up the rice. <laughs> the person whom we have trusted to protect has betrayed us. And that is what has happened. And the threat, the, the, the loss of trust, credibility is really there. Challenge to the family and society from perspective of the culture of silence. Yes, family is important, the strength is there. But when an abuse is discovered, there's a tendency to say nothing, to say face or to protect the good name of the family. And I hope that in the church, now I'm accountable, we will not keep quiet to protect the name of the church. We have to say something. Abuse, incest, etc. are kept out of sight from the neighbors, lest the community ostracize the family who will be humiliated or shamed. So the person who comes out sometimes will be shamed. And they will say, why do you bring disgrace to my community? And so as a church, now we need actually to offer a listening ear to give voice to the children and women. How do we do that? It's empowerment, letting them speak to us, listen to them, and allowing a safe space for that. So my accountability now, we're not even talking about safeguarding, uh, not talking about meeting the abused person or solving the problem. We have to go down back to basic and listen, let the children and women speak to us in the situation of where we are. So listening to children and empowerment of women, 
how what do we do? We organize PCSA session. We're going to do one in July when I go back for children, students, and youth. PCSA is acronym for Personal Child Safety Awareness. Or we call that in the first place. But no, second place, we change the name. Initially, we call Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse. And that is a name that we decided not to use because we said, we invite you to come for a Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse seminar. <laughs> no one will turn up. So we decided to go Personal Child Safety Awareness and we got the children in primary school to come forward and the, th and the children's, uh, the children from the liturgy, children's liturgy of the word to come. And during the session, we teach them about what is safe touch, uh, where people should not touch them and should they run and tell and should there be anything that they find in their life that's not appropriate, run and tell the adults. So we are there to listen to them. It's a very simple non-threatening program that children can attend. And we form the ladies' guild, groups in parishes and in women. Only the women are there. We have session for them. Some are just simple social empowerment skill, but this is where the voices, if there are any abuse, or even uh, wife beating, etc., uh, by the husband, this, they, these are the issues that come forward and we are there, we can listen. So we go back down to, even with minimum financial, uh, these are easily carried out because it's not about putting a lot of resources, but just giving time and a space for them. I'm sorry about the English. Uh, I'm trying, I was typing it hastily. So the challenges is, I learned that victims can take up to 20, 30 or 40 years before they come out, come forth to talk of such abuse when they were young. I've learned that even if this has taken place before my time, and as the current Archbishop, I will have to take responsibility for the Catholic Church. As such, I need to be ready should, to take the responsibility when this surfaces. Bottom line, before you, all the bishops, I will be accountable and be judged on how I will respond before the public and media. So your support, your help will be much needed and I've learned so much from this conference. The good news is for me, I have to walk in faith. The Holy Spirit will use a one small action to bring changes beyond our expectation. At the Federation of Asian Bishops Conference on the 50th anniversary, October 2022, I brought up the need to continue promotion, promoting, to continue promoting the awareness of safeguarding in the Asian continent. Uh, this was picked up and later on at the February 2023 Asian continental level of the synodal process, uh, this came out. And I acknowledge strongly the Filipino Catholic safeguarding official my intervention on safeguarding and protection of minors, youth and vulnerable was noted by the Asian bishops and included in both reports. The Asian church has begun our journey slowly, but taking baby steps. So thank you to the Filipino uh, safeguarding team who are here in big numbers. Thank you for your support and putting that right inside the report and insisting is there. <laughs> Father Ramonita is here and the team is here. So we managed to get it in our Asian level for the first time, and I'm sure it went up to Rome. And then, now the accountability, the responsibility comes back to us. <laughs> so my learning curve and lessons. What can I do when I have limited resources? I carry the burden with my brothers and sisters from Africa. Uh, from countries that we do not have that much resources. I came from the land of Borneo, uh, which is the island in Malaysia. It's the outback of uh, the Malaysian developed. The Malaysia that you see in Kuala Lumpur is the developed Malaysia. We are in the jungle and I work uh, with the indigenous community. So, but I do know this thing. Every Catholic is given the Holy Spirit, baptism. We receive the anointing. Each of us has a circle or sphere of influence. Some influence are bigger and or far and wider with the use of media, but each person can impact the persons beside us. So only one thing is needed, the desire and willpower to do something, to make a difference. And I can begin by impacting the people around me. And that is what I think I heard many of you sharing that. 
do something from where we are. Uh, I want to share this with you. I was the one who shared in my group, we need to listen, first thing. What's the second step to do when we're dealing with the victim? Listen again. And the third thing, to listen. So it was picked up in the report. Listen, listen, listen. And that I pick up from Father Hans. So the Chinese word has this component they call ting. Who knows Chinese? This is the traditional Chinese, not the modern Chinese. Traditional Chinese writes this word. You can see the first part with like a door. It is ear. And the three stroke with a line across is king. And then on the other side, you can see the eye is a square box, like an eye. And the, the cross on top refers to ten. And then the one stroke across, everybody can write Chinese, this is one. When you say two, you draw two lines. When it's three, you draw three lines. <laughs> uh, for four, don't draw the fourth line. <laughs> it's different. The bottom is a heart. The, the curvy, I think, is, is quite good. It's like the ayata, everything the vest, the, the, in the heart. And what does it mean? It means this. When I listen to you with my ear, I give you my ten eyes, full attention. I listen to you with my one heart as if you are my king. And that's what it means to listen. Amazing, no? This is a traditional character. The modern one has changed, <laughs> unfortunately. But that's how we should listen to our victim. And we can hear the story. And I like Archbishop Po. He actually, in a way, uh, the advice is that don't do anything. The, uh, we were told at the beginning the bishop don't engage with the victim. Let the team be the one who faces everything, and we set up levels so that the bishop will not be implicated and will be uh, complicating the, the the court case and etc. It influ so causing to be influencing the decision. I will have to learn from you. How do we manage uh, to actually have people who have the heart of the shepherd to listen to the wounded people? and move forward. I, will, I don't have the answer, but I'm learning. And at the point in time where their cases have not come out, that I have to face the accuser, uh, accusing the church, I only have managed to face and the victim. It was outside the church contact who wanted to talk to me, and we shared about forgiveness, and it was healing for him to be able to forgive the, the, the abuser and to move on in life. He's still struggling, but to ever to come to terms that God loves him and he can still forgive and he can move forward in his life. I think that's the starting point. So to listen is something that we need to listen to the heart of the shepherd. How to put in place? Well, we'll we pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. A point that I forgot just now uh, was when I talk about the bishops and religious. The accountability in my group was asking the priest will have to answer before the bishop. Pope Francis has asked the archbishop is now responsible for the bishops, but who is responsible for the archbishop, the metropolitan? So I think it's a good idea to actually, a concept to move it forward the conference of bishop, brother bishops are responsible for each other. And at the same time, we insist we have the religious, this was brought up my group, the religious are gathering together and there's an alternative venue, voice that the religious can bring the issue up also without, uh, especially if the bishop is the one under question, that it can bring this up to the conference of bishop or alternative way so that the bishops are also accountable to one another, to the religious. So there's something maybe to be considered also. I move on lastly, and uh, this is from my bishop, who is the president of the Malaysian Singapore Brunei Bishops Conference. Whatever we do with setting up the PSO office, uh, steps to be accountable, to be responsible, always hold the victim at the very center of the narrative. Otherwise, we lose 
the person before us and we are dealing with procedures and cases and everything. But let's always keep that victim in the very center of what we are doing, the narrative. I think that's very important. And lastly, you may ask, now we are the bishop, I have my coat on, extra protection, I think, in case you are questioning me or getting me more things. <laughs> but uh, that, this joke aside, uh, what is missing? What is missing there? You are. There is no church uh, if you are missing. <laughs> Uh, uh, there's a typo there. There is no church if you are missing. So together, we are the church. So from this conference, I know I am not alone. Together, that means bishop, priest, religious, professional, lay, every one of us together, we can safeguard and protect our minors and vulnerable. Are you with me? <laughs> so together, we are the church. And lastly, coming from a small place, uh, you will not find the place. It's called Kuching, K-U-C-H-I-N-G. On the island of Borneo, it's a small town of less than one million people. Five loaves and two fish. Resources, I do not have much. Wealth, I'm limited. Willpower, I do have plenty. So what I have and what I can do within my sphere of influence, I'm willing to begin with one small action or more at a time. Like the five loaves and two fish, I offer my little to the, to the Lord Jesus. In his hands, the Lord will multiply and bless to feed 5,000 men and women and children. They are part of the ministry. So our Lord is a generous God who will give more than we need. 2 Corinthians 9, it says this, you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we'll correct the English because I was typing on this fellow, so it was a very hard to type on a small computer, but all the same, I have the things there. And so thank you very much, and God bless you all. And uh, over to you, Archbishop Paul. Thank, thank you very much, Archbishop Simon, for this very powerful presentation that brought to us especially also the cultural dimension with which we deal. You live in a very different situation uh, to what most of us here uh, are used to. Uh, and you highlighted also, as Archbishop Paul Andre did, the, the hands-on approach and your own commitment and your own willingness uh, to engage with this. And this, as, as we all know, is very much needed. So the idea was that you would have reactions to each other now, uh, some questions or comments or whatever, um, on the grounds of what you have just said, Archbishop Simon, coming back to what Archbishop Paul André had said, what would be a comment maybe also from the cultural perspective, maybe also from the procedural perspective to what he presented as the 16 points. I'll let him take first, go first, because I jumped the gun just now. <laughs> it's all about the Paul. <laughs> yeah, Archbishop Paul, sorry. Uh, yes. Um, what, what, what struck me is how much the things you were talking about are in those uh, 16 attitudes we need to develop. Owning the problem, uh, seeing the problem, first of all, seeing the problem. I mean, the fact that you, you were able to see and name the problem when other people were not speaking that, were not uh, naming the problem, is remarkable. Uh, but then, 
also owning it, deciding that you were going to do something. I, this is what I take away most strongly from you, is that I can always do something. It's, uh, it's close to that, that one comment I was making. What more can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And you were saying, there, I can always do something. Uh, that decision to say that I'm not powerless and that I can make a difference is, I think, the heart of what accountability is about. The contrary of accountability is to say, I can't do anything. That's the way it is. You know, and wash your hands and walk away. Uh, what you pointed out and, and gave as clear examples, concrete examples, is what can happen when somebody decides to make a difference. The other thing I, I, I found beautiful, you know, uh, one of the points that I was making was the ability to uh, not be bound by structural boundary, you know, uh, I'm forgetting the language there, but not working in silos, you know, going beyond. The, so, for example, the collaboration between religious leaders and bishops in working together on this problem uh, getting the Filipinos to work with you, <laughs> you know, to, to collaborate. The, all of these are examples. Uh, you speak about the culture of silence. I just want to make a point here. You know, uh, we, you, you probably look at North America and say, in North America, there is no silence. And that's true. The, the television has become the confessional. YouTube has become the confessional. Everybody, there's nothing you hide anymore. But... Um, that wasn't true a couple of generations ago. My mother, I'll tell you a story that my mother told me when she was a child. Uh, their next door neighbor, he worked in the lumber fields for months, all the winter months he was in the, 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 the lumber fields. And then he would come back to the house for a couple of weeks. And then he would go off to work. And at the house, there were a number of little girls in this house. And in my mother's house, there were a number of little girls. So the little girls always spent time. They were good friends. They always spent time. But when the father would come, my grandfather would tell my mother and her sisters, nobody goes next door. Nobody goes next door until monsieur goes back to work. And my mother tells me, that it took her a while to understand what was going on. But what was going on was that man was abusing his children. But back then you didn't speak about that. Families didn't speak about that, it was a family secret. Everybody knew, but nobody said anything. And there were no laws back then, there were no structures to respond to that, and that abuse went on for years. So that culture of silence was the culture of silence that my mother grew up in. It has gone now, for better or for worse. For better, that that kind of abuse does not go on without people speaking about it. For worse, because in a sense there is no more, there is a lack of intimacy, of respect, of privacy, of pudeur. How do you say pudeur in English? Uh, pudeur, is that the right word? I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, a kind of self-respect. That, that, that is gone. But at, the, but at the same time, the secrecy was horrible. The secrecy was horrible. And, and that's what led to so many cases in the church in North America too. So what you're living, we lived. And we need to grow out of that. And what you are doing is remarkable. And the last thing I'd just like to say is that you referred to the story of the loaves and the fishes. In John's Gospel, it says that before Jesus, you know, shared the loaves and the, the fishes, he, uh, he gave thanks. He took the bread and the fishes, he gave thanks, and then he shared them. And at one point in my meditating on that story, it struck me. How could Jesus give thanks? He only had five loaves and two fishes in front of all that. He gave thanks. And I tell myself... It's out of his gratitude that the miracle arrived. So I would like to share Jesus' gratitude for your five loaves and two fishes. 
And may you always continue to make them multiply wherever you go. Thank you. So I thank you, uh, Archbishop Paul, for your kind words. Uh, we actually do not know each other until uh, here we met. And uh, he, the points that he took out, I took down the 16 points. I think uh, it is also something that a preparation for me and also the church in Asia to go forward. I would even add on church in Africa, Latin America, places we think uh, we are, uh, at least for my place, uh, East Asia. I know we are slow to respond and uh, for many years we have been keeping a bit silent thinking that this is a Western problem and we saw everything happening uh, in uh, Ireland was very close to us because we were uh, evangelized by the Irish and Mew Hugh from England so it's very close to us uh, and we also, I recognize that I, Irish community are very family close-knitted, like the Italian community. And that also reminded me of where we are, close-knitted community. And we thought it would never, Ireland would be very kind and forgiving uh, to the situation. But as it turns, turns out, we hear how serious it is and the church also loses credibility. So what you shared, how you struggled through that is a wake-up call for us in Asia that we do have to respond. When it comes, at least I do not want to, uh, what's called it, uh, we have, we can see what is going to happen and be prepared for that. So that accountability is already going back to us to make sure that there will be cases Philippines are getting the, the blunt of it at the moment. The other countries are a bit more slower, but when it does come, we know what to, how to pre, uh, what to expect, and the preparation begins now for us in Asia. And so that the church can be a voice to continue to speak for the voiceless. And we have a lot of human, uh, human rights issue, besides sexual abuse, uh, trafficking, migrants, put all this together, we have a big thing, a lot of things to do. And now knowing all this, hearing all this, the accountability still comes back to the church. But as I said, the blessing for us in Asia is community comes first. So I pray that the church will remain one as a community with the support of the lay faithful, the priest religious, we focus on the family and respond together as a church community. And that together, the bishop, with the support, we can do something. Uh, I will not be alone, for together we are the church. And we hope that the Asian church will remain as one and we can do something together. So I thank you for all your steps you've given us. I'm sure uh, from here we learn so much from all of you. And well, we'll see, we'll pray that. Uh, we are, after all, we are the one Catholic church in the world. And together, the body, theology of the body, St. Paul says, whatever happens uh, to one part of the body, it hurts. Then we should all be feeling that, and we are all one Catholic church. So thank you for your points. And, uh, and for those who are viewing, I'm sorry, there are a lot of mistakes in the uh, English. I didn't have time to correct that because I, uh, as I said, I was typing on a small computer and trying to <laughs> fit everything inside there. <laughs> and I think I made a lot of mistake in the correction uh, because I just got the slides out just before uh, 1 p.m. So uh, hearing you trying to put everything inside and uh, trying to include your, your listening to you and putting in your views. So thank you very much again, uh, Father, uh, no sorry, Archbishop Paul for the because I have a priest called Father Paul, so, <laughs> so Archbishop Paul for the uh, insights and uh, for pointing me in the direction and see how we can do it together. Uh, Father Hans, thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you to the two of you for your presentations and this conversation. And we will come back and I'm looking forward to the conversation also with all of you in half an hour. So 4.30, we'll be back here. I
Saya dua mai. There is such a wonderful atmosphere and so much networking going on, and I'm afraid uh, I have to interrupt that uh, because we would like to have at least a few minutes, not much is left, um, of interaction with you, observations, questions. Not much time is left because uh, the Brits need to leave by 5.15 for their taxi and the Aussies by 5.30 or so. So I, I suppose that we finish by 5.15, which leaves us now for at, at the most half an hour um, because there are a few announcements also before we, we finish this session. And as for the proceeding, I would invite you to make your observations and comments now, and we would gather three in each round, and then <clears throat> the two archbishops decide who is responding to what. And be, uh, please be as clear uh, and articulate as possible so that we can also have a, a clear notion of what is being asked and commented on. And be brief, please. One, Susan. Thank you, bishops. Um, my question is about, um, in terms of giving feedback to bishops, um, you know, I, I work for an archbishop who is particularly gifted in welcoming honest and candid feedback and receiving that graciously. And I have such a personality that I don't have trouble giving that to him. But um, I, and my coworkers, so many of them, both priests, deacons, and laity, really struggle with that. And even in an environment where the archbishop himself is soliciting this feedback, and it's a it's a real challenge. And so, you know, we can imagine like like the hierarchical structure contributes to that. Clericalism contributes to that. Um, but what what would you recommend or suggest in terms of creating an environment where people feel comfortable doing that um, in the church? Thank you. For the Marek. Thank you. Um, it's linked for what you already said. Uh, do you believe that without the changing uh, of the concentration of the power of the, the hand of the one man in diocese, is it possible to really change something? Um, and is it necessary that all the power is going to, to the bishop? Uh, Third question up there. My question will be about the initial formation for priesthood as bishops in charge of priests in their diocese based on your experience of having cases of abuse among priests. What elements would you consider today as necessary to underline very strongly in a practical way in the initial formation to priesthood? Thank you. So we stop for this round now. Who would like to start with the first question on the feedback and the environment for feedback, how to create that. Uh, the question about feedback, how do you create an environment on, on feedback? The, if um, I invite you, I don't know if you took a note of the, the resource I, I gave, you know, the, the source of the 16 is called the, the Oz Principle. And these authors, what they're talking about, and it connects a bit with the question that you are asking, is it one person? What they're talking about is building an accountable organization. So I took it and applied it to me in my role right now as a bishop. But what we should be doing is building organizations where people embrace accountability. So for example, on feedback, where people, everybody involved in the organization comes to realize how important feedback is to receive and to give feedback. Now, the only way to do that is to gather the people to talk about this, to reflect on the role of feedback. 
So maybe something that could be done would be to bring people together and to look at these 16 points and to say this is, this is an accountable organization is like this. Um, where are we strong? Where do we need to develop? So it, the, the key, I, I think, and this is the challenge, and in response then to your question, no, I don't think everything can respond, rest on one person's shoulders, whether it be the bishop alone or whether it be the, the person who's in charge of uh, safe environments. Uh, I don't think one person alone can do it. We need to build accountable teams that, that work together. And um, it's, it's, I think it's linked with the challenge of building a synodal church. I really do. Because a synodal church is one where we are able to speak to each other and receive from each other that feedback. I have to say, I shared this with my group this morning, that I think I've lived a synodal experience here. In the small groups that I was in, that for me is synodality. I learned so much from the people around me, and I thank God for that. First of all, I think uh, you're yeah, talking about bishops, I, we have to learn to listen. And so this is something that uh, we have to impress uh, on us bishops, that we ourselves have to be able to sit back and listen to what the people are saying. And we also had that experience back home when we do the synodal process. And with three days program, uh, we gather them and look at all the facets of uh, the church. Unfortunately, at that time, two years back, uh, the safeguarding did not come up so strongly, and it was usually a bit lacking in the Asian context. Now we're beginning, uh, at least I'm the one who's beginning to raise up the issue. But uh, when we look at pastoral program, I remember uh, f following the footsteps of my former, uh, my predecessor, Archbishop. We were there, but I did not say anything for three days. I just listened to all the report coming in. I think that's the first step the bishops have to learn to listen. Uh, that we do not know everything, as Archbishop Paul said, we just have to hear, and sometimes a hard truth where we fail, where we are lacking. So that's the first step, and it depends on the individual and also in the culture. But uh, I pray that, uh, well, work with the bishop, and if you want to say things to the bishop, uh, I learned this from my professor, I do, did social communication here in Rome uh, many years back. He said, in Asia, uh, in the West, we tend to shout to get attention. But in Asia, sometimes bringing the fact clearly is better. All right. Could you, could you focus on, the, yeah. on that last question, since you have worked in the seminary uh, <laughs> setting also, uh, okay. as, a, as a spiritual director, as a professor, right. what, what is for priestly formation okay. what you consider important? Uh, just to close, use the synodal process that we have is the best tool we have to get the bishops to listen and we learn to listen. Formation of priests, uh, we're beginning to realize the importance, so we are screening and we're putting more back human formation, psychology, uh, and hopefully it will be able to work out on that. We're still struggling with that in the Asian context, uh, but definitely there's something that the formation, the selection of candidates will be something we need to do. It's a perennial question that we have been always trying to do. I think uh, American, uh, Canadian, Western church is also doing that. So the formation, we already started safeguarding right first, and we told the priest and the seminarian, let it not happen. Uh, intellectually, they know, but whether it will happen or not, we, we pray it will not happen because these things will happen when they're in ministry later on. So we impress on them the importance of safeguarding. So safeguarding has to be for us in Asia context, something we hardly say about speak about, so it has to be brought right into the front and say that let's be accountable for that and we start with seminary in the Asian context. I do not know the uh, uh, Western context. Other Paul, Archbishop Paul. I would just add that uh, I think right now the seminaries, at least in Canada, my experience, are doing very good work at the uh, initial formation. I'm becoming more and more convinced that it's the ongoing formation that is key. Uh, and that, that, along with evaluation, I think we need to learn 
to integrate evaluation and ongoing formation in the lives of our priests. Thank you. I add on another point. We're involving women who are counseling psychologists, women in the male seminary as part of formation team for Asia is a big thing to move to allow the women to come in seminary to work and let the seminarians and the priests also listen to them. So this is part of the women empowerment that will bring accountability eventually and also feminine touch to formation, be in touch with feelings. And did came up uh, yesterday that, you know, can seminarians can cry with a man, but still to be in touch with her feminine self and to be able to respond in this formation. So we're including women in our formation team. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So a second round of questions, Suzanne. Thank you. Not a question, but a thank you. Um, you touched me, um, Father pa Paul, and, uh, Bishop, Archbishop, sorry, <laughs> um, when you were talking about being personally invested, you said that if you're not personally invested as the bishop, you run the risk of disengaging. And as a victim's assistance person working with survivors, the laity can only do so much and they want to partner with the laity and the clergy. And so we have to keep aware that we can't disengage. So thank you for giving me a reason because bishops delegate. See, I understand now. <laughs> Second question. Maybe my question will be too personal. Uh, you give us a very good concept. What my question is that what was or what is the most suffering question in this field in your uh, leadership. So what was the more questionable, more b biggest question remark during your decision, during, during your leadership in this field that's safeguarding? And thirdly, uh, Attorney Lisa. Um, first of all, thank you, Your Grace, for the talk. Um, in sustaining organizational accountability, would you consider, Your Grace, supporting an independent, totally independent body to look into or to address the issues of sexual abuse and in order to ensure the integrity of the investigative process? What are your thoughts? Thank you. So who would like to start with this second observation question? You're, you asked, did you ask what was the, the most suffering thing for me? Is that right? Uh, I, I don't know it's the most, most suffering. I, I'll tell you about the moment where I experienced um, personally, when I arrived, I, I was an auxiliary bishop for five years, and then I was named to a diocese. And uh, where, there were, where there had been allegations that there was a pedophile ring involving priests and police and judges, and there was a four-year public inquiry in this diocese. And so I was at the heart of that inquiry for four years. Um, so that at my installation ceremony, there was a demonstration of very, very angry people. And... Um, I could, I could have avoided them, but I knew I couldn't avoid them. So what should have been a kind of a joyful moment, you know, coming to a new diocese, being greeted by the people and everything, um, I, I had to go out and meet those people, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> I, Somebody yelled at me as, as I'm going towards that. Somebody yelled at me of that crowd. Are you gay? Are you gay? And I, I was stunned. And I looked at him. And I said, it's none of your business. <laughs> and he started scheming. He's gay. He's gay. <laughs> it, was, it, it was crazy. It was crazy. And... Uh, and I just remember standing there for 15 minutes and being just 
inundated by all the anger and the, 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 the pain of people. Um, and, then, and then after saying, look, uh, you know, there, there's a ceremony, the church is filled, everybody's waiting. I'll make an appointment. Who wants to come and speak with me? Tomorrow we'll meet. And we made an appointment and nobody showed up, but that's another story. And, and then I walked in and I had to vest. And, uh, and the funny thing was that there was nobody to help me to vest. I, I, I didn't know where my vestments were. I was looking for them and everybody was talking and I just felt so alone at that moment. It was probably the hardest moment for me. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, the sexual abuse has not come out yet. I think now when it comes, it will be my greatest cross and suffering to carry the burden. But as a bishop, I was less than a year when I was assaulted outside the high court for another reason, uh, for standing up for religious freedom. That, uh, and that was when uh, it was the hardest moment of my life to realize that my life could be in danger uh, because I stood for the Christian faith for people who want to convert back to Christianity in Malaysia is an issue of uh, reconversion. So that was my biggest uh, cross, the suffering to realize that it, life is not going to be the same. And indeed, it was never the same. But thank the Lord that uh, it worked out well from uh, the messages engaging the press and uh, crossing the message. And it helped to calm the situation down and give credibility to the church. But it's something that I agonize over how it could have turned ugly. Uh, the organizational accountability, back to the question, I think uh, it is good to have uh, listening to some of you and uh, maybe an independent <laughs> group to address that the bishop with a team, talk to the American bishop, a team who loves the church, who is able to be given the space to speak to the bishop and about situation over the organization is something eventually I think we might have to go for that for organizational accountability as an independent group. But I also want that I hope these are people who love the church and who has a faith, who believe and then say the hard things. And I pray that we as bishop will be open to listen and together with uh, the, the church we can uh, make a difference. It has to be tested, but it's something that is a possibility that uh, we pray that we have good bishops who have the concern of the smell of the ship, the people in their heart, and can do that. How it will happen, how fast, how soon it needs to be happened fast, but uh, depends on uh, the bishop. And as I say, when you speak to the bishop, uh, shouting does not help. Uh, understanding, uh, being with the bishop, bring up that hard issue that is, uh, uh, and I pray the bishop will listen, as we say, listen to the heart and to see the real issue and make a difference and if need to, to change our attitude also. Thank you. And the independence of the investigative yeah. team? Just a question, uh, the independence of the investigative team. Um, in our, in Canada, this is the situation. Um, if the person who either is alleging that they are being victimized or that somebody is saying this person is being, being victimized, if that person is under 18 years old, that must be reported to the equivalent of a, what we call a children's aid society or in Quebec, la direction de la protection jeunesse. Automatically, it's out of our hands. We must report that. So it goes right away. If the person is over 18 and they come to our diocese and they say, I, I've been abused or I was abused by a priest who's still living, I invite them, will you go to the police? We'll help you. We'll go to the police. We want the police to be involved. We don't want to be investigating this. We want the police to be involved so that it's independent. Um, and if the person, it very, very rarely, the third option that is happening is that they're suing the diocese. So we get a letter from a lawyer saying that father, uh, this person is saying father and so-and-so abused him and he's asking for $300,000.
Well, we can't investigate then because we don't have access to the victim. You know, it, it goes through a legal process and back and forth. So the few cases we have where we're called to investigate, usually the priest is dead. Somebody comes to us and says, I had a case recently. A priest abused me when I was a kid. It happened 60 years ago, but I need to talk to someone. And so then we, I have somebody in the staff look at the dossier of the priest, look at where they were and everything. And uh, we can't really investigate more than that because the priest is dead. But if, the, the, if it fits, we say, come, what can we do to help you? So that's where it is right now. So what I'm saying is that in Canada, it's very rare that the diocese is called to investigate uh, the crime. I add on, I think uh, there are two levels. The organizational uh, accountability can take place when there's no case. That's the best time to do the uh, evaluation and check the system. Because when there's a case on, if it is a uh, minor, definitely is already a criminal uh, charge. And, and this is definitely out of the hand of the church. It's under the police and the department to deal with that. But uh, I take the point that the organizational accountability is good to be able to have somebody to help us to check and to look through it first, uh, especially when there's no threat so that we can respond and draw up the best practices. If it's already a case on hand, then it's a different matter. I also add that in the context of many countries, we sometimes have a question over the police investigation. How well will they investigate and how professional are they? So bear in mind that not all countries have the system in place and uh, it may have more harm or, or to the victim or it's not properly handled. So I do not know how much confidence we all have in the uh, system, the, the police system that, uh, for investigation and for reporting. So that's another consideration. I don't have the answer, but uh, it will be something definitely that will come out when there is a case. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another one or two questions? And then we close. Thank you so much, uh, Archbishops. My own question is with regards to two theological principles of the church. Every Sunday we profess the universality of the church and also we know that bishops have what we call collegiality. What role do those two play in response to the cases of abuse? I could hear around us here that it, not, it is not happening in my area, it's not, but we are talking about one church. If it's happening in Canada, it's happening in the church. So what, what role, and also when it happens in one diocese in Canada, what support do you get as a bishop from your brother bishops around? Or you are just on your own, it's just like the day you were installed where you find yourself there alone, and your brothers, are, in fact, sometimes they hide. They don't want to be seen, to be connected to you as a bishop who has been going through the issues of abuse. So thank you so much for your, your presentation. Um, in my culture, we have a saying that goes like, the frogs can't be the ones to dry out the swamp. So my question is, um, how do you see your roles as bishops? How do you work with people from outside the church? Where are the points where you see that you need to rely on them to have a more objective view? And especially when it's about making judgment and decisions, where do you feel um, the power is in good hands with you? Or are there points where maybe someone who's not part of the system, not part of the church, has a higher potential of being objective? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thank you very much for your what have you said. It's nice to see so good and positive bishops uh, but I, I would like to share with my personal experience that sometimes I really I'm really tired with this thought that I have to fight with bishop, that I have to fight with them, 
and I don't want to do that. So my question is, because we sometimes, I'm from Slovak Republic now, and we sometimes feel this defense attitude. So how it is possible? Is it just the, the matter of culture that in Asia or in Canada it is possible to cooperate with you? Or is it a matter of gender that I am a, re a religious sister? So we women really, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, so if you could advise something, I would be very grateful uh, how to open this gate and to cooperate with you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would ask you to be succinct in your response, yeah. respectively. Uh, in my place, at least the bishops conference up together, so there's no... Uh, if one bishop has the issue, then the whole lot come together to try to help out with the PSO. And we have uh, the same PSO uh, professional standard office procedure throughout Malaysia. And so we ex depend on one another for extra resources. Then working for outside the church that I've already answered, we'll try to see what we can do to move it forward for accountability. Uh, not Asia is not uh, as simple as it is because we face the same issue that bishops will deny there are cases and so on. So we are just beginning to speak about it through me at least. I'm sure other bishops will resonate with them. But uh, there are those who will not take it up also. So you may end up there also to fight with the bishop. But having said that, this is a forum that we can bring back the thing and bring back the finding and share. And there are bishops who will be willing, there are priests who will be willing to be with you and we work with these people uh, and all in the church to, to move it forward so that this will come to the attention also of the church authority. And you have a direct resource also to the, uh, to the dicastery if need to. So we will try to support where we can. I just stand as one little bishop on the island and with some other bishops of me, but the rest I can't say for them. Uh, what support do I get from the bishops around me? Uh, I would say, first of all, at the level of the conference, we, we talk about these issues, and uh, particularly at the level of, uh, in Canada, we have the national conference, but we have four regional assemblies, and the Assembly of Bishops of Quebec is a very uh, fraternal organization, and uh, we have very good conversations around the table. And when one of us is in difficulty, is facing a, uh, a hard situation, they feel very free to call another. I, I get, often get calls. <laughs> so, so I think there's a support network among the bishops and uh, an effort to learn from best practices from one another, and, and that goes on. Um, the need for an objective view in making judgments, absolutely. I, I, I think there are situations where we do need somebody from outside. I, I had a case a uh, couple of years ago where it was not a child, but it was a, uh, somebody was alleging that a priest was trying to take money from, from a woman, but it was an anonymous allegation, and it took me a while to try to figure out who it was. But finally, I approached the police, and I asked the police, I know you don't have the complaint, but could you go and investigate? Because I don't have the staff to do this and the objectivity. And so it's the police that went. And when they came back, they said, we did the investigation, there's no problem. You know, so I think that's really important to have that outside objective view as much as possible. Um, and finally, I have to f fight with my bishop. I'm. Yeah, I'm sure if you came to my diocese, you could find a few priests who would say they fight with their bishop. <laughs> um, but I, I don't, you know, how, how do you deal with someone who's maybe not at the right place or doesn't have the qualities we're looking for to deal with this kind of issue? Maybe they have other qualities. It's, it's so hard right now, I find, in the church because we expect the one person to be able to do all things to, for all people. And so I think the only thing I can say is I would try to be a friend. I would try to be a friend and to see what that person's needs are. And, and find out what makes them tick and try to establish a rapport with them. 
but it's not possible with everyone. I realize that too. So I have no answer. I'm sorry. So thank you very much <clears throat> to the two archbishops for being uh, bishops as you are <laughs> and in the model and in the with the heart there and I think for all of us it has become clear that your heart is there and this is something that is probably surprising for a few of us who have had different experiences in this but um, your self-reflectedness, uh, your own understanding of your responsibility and co-responsibility, and uh, your way also of interacting with each other has been certainly a model for us. So thank you. Uh, can I just add? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, okay, don't shoot every bishop you see on site. Some bishops are on your side, okay? Uh, just joke, just joking with you. But uh, there's some point that I kept coming back at the break that people talk about individualism, in being individual and uh, being community. So I think there's something that uh, this is way uh, the East has something to offer. The East has a dialogue approach to live in harmony with all the races and culture in the context that we are in. So we have no choice. We have to live with other faith, other culture, and that has allowed us to seek the way of harmony, the way of dialogue in Asia. Otherwise, we'll be fighting already. And so that because of that, it makes everything community for the good of the community. So don't say about other religion, other race, mm -hmm. so that we can live in community. That unfortunately kept us focused more on community. Whereas my experience of going to the West, it allows the individual, the person to come out. So it's not choosing this or that. It's not either or, or American will say either or. It's not that. It is to be able to put the two together, to see the individual, respect the person as an individual, and to seek to live within the community so that the individual has a voice to say. And yet, it is in the context of the community for the common good that we're looking at. So it is not either or, either or, but it is individual and community together. And I think when we do that, we can do much more together. Love God, it is one, but at the same time, our neighbor is there, love our neighbor. So put the two together. So I'm not advocating for either this side or that side, but bring the two together, uh, individual, and community, and we can make the difference there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again for also uh, this Asian insight, not only teaching us Chinese letters, um, but also bringing us this type of reflection. And this is precisely also the point uh, that uh, this International Safeguarding Conference wants to do, precisely this strengthening us, us, ourselves, in our individual knowledge, in our individual uh, self-esteem also, and uh, at the same time also reaching out to other people, which is always one of the most beautiful byproducts of this gathering, that we, are, we have the availability and the possibility to network, and that is happening uh, constantly in this gathering and that is why at this point it feels a bit awkward for me but it is some closure now because some will have to go away in a few minutes um, uh, although we will have an academic day but not all will participate so I would like to say uh, at least this um, we have dealt with accountability and probably it is or it feels at least uh, for many of us like um, we had not much of a clear idea of what accountability is about, but after these days we have even more questions um, to whom uh, it is addressed, who is responsible and what for. So this is an ongoing conversation and I hope that we, all of us can engage in this individually in our studies, in our ongoing formation, but also uh, in the groups, in the uh, different institutions and in the different constellations in which we work together. We have also realized, I believe, that uh, taking this example of accountability, our 
cultural, uh, societal, legal context is so diverse that we also need to take stock of that reality. As a Catholic Church, we, we come from all these countries and uh, no one has the right solution. There's no one size fits all approach. And uh, that is difficult to digest because if one lives in one's own bubble, in one's own country, in one's own institution, uh, one thinks that this is all about it. Hmm. No, it's not so easy. But I think, my perspective, uh, uh, this is an exercise also of listening and of engaging, as the Archbishop has said, in a similar way. Um, so thank you for being here and thank you for, for continuing to build the common ground on which we will have different opinions, various priorities, and diverse standpoints. Fair enough. As long as we realize that this is a common effort and a common endeavor and our goal is a safer church and a safer world, I think that can very well work out, even if our accents in English are sometimes quite challenging. Um, so, final point, we would suggest tentatively for next year's <clears throat> International Safeguarding Conference the following dates, so that you put that in your agendas. 18 to 21, same as this year. 18 to 21, June 2024, same venue. Um, Tentatively, we will need to check uh, with the holes and so forth, but uh, that is. And also tentatively, just that you know, we are considering to put on the agenda uh, the question of uh, safeguarding and disabilities. This could be one uh, topic, but you are free to suggest any, um, any other area that you would like to have, uh, and we will discuss that in the steering committee. With this, I uh, would also say that at 8 uh, p.m., so 20 hours, we will start the buffet dinner here in the hall. So hope to see you all uh, after some reception at the British or the Australian Embassy and the others who will have maybe a, a drink elsewhere. So uh, welcome at 8 and thank you again.